the end. Right now we're covering chapter 5, and since the exam covers chapter 1 through 4, you don't have to go into a panic that there's going to be anything on the exam that, you know. It's a real uh, mean prof who covers stuff on the very last day, and you're supposed to you know, know that on the exam the next day. I, I don't think that's too cool. So we were talking about the wrapper classes. The wrapper classes have the same name as the primitive types. Primitive types are just like, you know, pure numbers, 1, 2, 3, or 1, 2, dot, 3, 4, or the word false, or the word true. I don't know why they don't have Boolean listed as a wrapper class, because there is a wrapper class for Boolean. Everything here is just a pure number, ultimately. Even a character is just ultimately a number. We've been talking about those ASCII values, right, 65 being an uppercase A. And so these are classes that let you manipulate this kind of stuff. And I believe we showed how to get the maximum value of an int and the lowest value of an int and things like that. So we looked at that. We're just going to look a little bit more at it. We're going to use the parse function. You don't always have the nicety of being able to do next int and get an int. If somebody's filling in a web form or something like that, the data is probably coming to you as a string rather than as an int. And so you have to know how to convert from one to another. Now, some languages, you spend all your time doing your conversions. Python doesn't input stuff as a number, and so you have to always convert from that string to a number. But in Java, we usually use next int and next double and stuff like that, and so it works great. But what if we couldn't? Let's go ahead and create our scanner. Scanner SC equals new. Scanner, parentheses, system, dot in, in parentheses, semicolon. We know we're going to need our import statement. I never can remember. Does the import go above or below package? I guess we'll find out. I'm going to add the import for it. So I'm going to click on the arrow, add import Java. It goes below the package, but instead I'm going to make it java.util.asterisk so I don't have to add any more imports, most likely, for the rest of the day. All right, and so we can ask the user to type in a number. System.out.print, parentheses, quote, enter a number, end quote, in parentheses, semicolon. Let's give them a greater than sign to tell them where to type. And then string. Notice this is a capital letter. All the primitive data types start with lowercase letters. If it's an uppercase letter, it means it's a class. So int, lowercase, is a primitive data type, meaning it doesn't have any methods in this, in this language, unlike some languages like C Sharp, where even ints and floats and doubles have methods attached to them. So string s equals, and I'm not going to use next int because I'm reading into a string. So sc dot next, or next line if I want them to be able to type in something with spaces. In this particular case, I don't need to let them type in something with spaces, right? Because it's just supposed to be a number. But I'm going to go ahead and leave it like that. Actually, I'm going to leave it as next, and then I'm going to print out the string. This is just to prove something. There's not going to be our final answer. System.out.print ln parentheses quote s equals space end quote plus s, like that. So when I run it, I said when I run it, so down here, enter a number. Since I use next, it only picks the first piece of data I type in. If I type in Joe Bob and it prints out S, it's just Joe. Bob is sitting there waiting to be read in by the next statement. But if I use next line, it gets all of the data until they hit the enter key. And so there are times when you want to use each one. Next line is good if they're going to be entering data with a space, like if you ask for an address, right? 
you don't even know how many addresses are going to be. So you're not going to call dot next to try to read in the address. You're going to use next line to get the whole thing. So I'm just using next line just for no good reason, just to show it. Yep, that's right below my package if you added a package. Don't type that package in if yours already isn't there. Okay, so now let's convert it to a number that we can do something with. Double D, lowercase d, on double, equals, and now we're going to use parse. So uppercase D, double dot parse double, parentheses S, in parentheses semicolon. Now it's a number, and I can do math with it. And the folks who've taken Python recognize that as doing this. This is how you did it in Python, right? But Python has a nice, short, sweet, clean syntax, right? So that's why that's nice and short. But that's how you convert from a string. What if you want to go back the other way? What if you want to take a double? Excuse me. Yeah, you want to take a double, and you want to turn it into a string. Well, how about this? S equals double dot to string parentheses D in parentheses semicolon. That's one way to convert a number to a string. There's a cheap, easy, short way of doing it, though. And if I was typing in my code and I was being paid by, you know, productivity, I would do it like this. That also takes D and converts it into a string. Why? Because it starts off with an empty space, with an empty quote, and then it concatenates D. And when it sees that it's supposed to be doing the concatenation, it converts that to a string automatically. So whereas this would be a syntax error, because you cannot convert a double to a string automatically, it's more than happy to take the empty string and then add the concat, excuse me, and then concatenate the string version of the double. So that's a fast way of doing a conversion. I shouldn't say fast, but it's fast to type, right? Convert D to a string. Also convert D to a string. Either way works. I guess this is more strictly correct, but you're going to see a whole bunch of people do it that way because it's really as efficient. There's no reason not to do it that way. And what did this one do? This converted convert string to a double. And what did next line do? It allowed input including spaces. So if you're going to ask for somebody's name, they might put in one word, they might put in two words, they might put in three words. If their name is George William John the Three, they might put in four words, right? You know, or whatever. If you don't know how many words they're going to put in, you'd use next line. This is giving me warnings. The assigned value is never used. Yeah, no kidding. Okay, fine. I don't care. The wrapper classes are part of java.lang. Everything inside of java.lang is imported without having to add an import statement. It's just imported by default. And if we want to see what's inside java.lang, we could type in java.lang. And we see a whole bunch of things, right? including the wrapper classes like float and double and stuff, and a whole bunch of other things, too. The math class. Java.lang.math.pow parentheses 2 to the comma 3, right? Now, that's a really silly way of getting a hold of the POW function because java.lang is imported automatically, and so we all we have to really do is do that, right? Didn't have to add the whole thing. That's probably an error. Yeah. I'll make that a double. Or, you know, just math.pow2, comma, 3. 
but you can specify the package if you have not imported it. When I was creating a scanner, if I did not want to add the import for it, I could have done this. Scanner sc2 equals new java.util.scanner, right? I could have done that. I did not have to add the import. I could just specify the package instead. If you're used to using C++, that's like the using namespace. If you leave out the using namespace, you have to put the, pull, the full path to the object. But if you put include the namespace with the using keyword, then you get to leave the path out. And in this case, we're calling it the package. You can leave that out as long as you have the import up here. So why use the wrapper classes? This is mentioning that if you use a graphical user interface, then when you pull your data in, it's going to come in as a form of a string. Let's play with that. Let's play with that. We haven't done this yet. We're going to make a, a window where we type in a number and we square it and we display the results. And this may take the rest of the class, but that's okay. File. Well, we need time to... Uh, to do the review, right? So we'll try to stop it at eight. But do file new project. Choose Java application. Click next, but don't make a main class. Deselect that and call it lecture N2 or something like that. The reason we're not going to create a main class is we're going to add a form. And the form is going to become our main class. But if there already is a file by that name, then it's a, um, we'd have to delete it. And, and that just, this is just saving a step. All right, so over here, among your projects, come over to source packages find your lecture into or whatever you called it and do new jframe form and if you don't see jframe form listed there under the new right click on your source package new jframe form and if you don't see that click other and then you can apply a filter jframe and you'll find it I'm just going to give it a default name no I'm not I'm going to call it lecture into And then we get a form designer. The form designer lets us drag buttons out. Maybe you've used something like this in another language. So we could drag a label out. I'm going to right click on that and do edit text to give it a better name than label one. Like if we're going to calculate somebody's salary, we need to know the hours worked. So you saw what I did. I dragged the label out. I right clicked on it and I did edit text. And I changed it to hours work. And now I'm going to change this to hourly pay rate. It's going to be the other one. Now I'm going to drag out some places for them to actually enter this data. Those are called text boxes. We need to find the text box under the swing controls. Okay. Well, okay. How did you? Maybe, how were you able to type the hours worked and hours? I'm so sorry. Pardon me. How were you able to type the hours worked and hours? I right clicked on it and did edit text. Okay. <clears throat> and I guess they're not called text boxes in this editor. They're called text fields. So I'm going to drag a text field and I'm going to drag another text field.
and we're going to calculate their overtime and their total pay. So we're going to make a label here for overtime. So I'm going to right click on it. Overtime bonus. I'm going to drag another label out that says total pay. And I'm going to need two text fields to display those results. So I'm going to drag a text field and put it there. And another one and put it there. And then try to do a little bit of arranging to make it look a little bit prettier, maybe. And then we need a button that's going to take these pieces of input and fill that in. So let's take our button. All right, we're not nearly being done, but we saw how easy it was to draw the form. Now, when you create graphical user interfaces with Java, you don't have to use a forms editor. You can have your program create all of this itself. But if you do have a form editor and it can get you started, then it's kind of nice. So J button one is the text is kind of lame, so I'm going to right click and edit the text of the button to calculate pay. That's a little bit better. Notice that it puts all of these sliders and stuff here. You can get drive yourself mad trying to position everything exactly. Uh, what are you missing? Because I'm right clicking on it and choosing edit text. Oh, do I need to do? Oh, that's okay. Actually, I need to put a text field there. That's okay. I got it now. Okay, cool deal. Yeah, these are text fields. So you, the white ones are the text fields, the gray ones are the labels, and then this is a button. Yep. Okay. So double click on the pay button. Just double click right on it. And we can't see where it added it. It's kind of annoying. We can't see where it added it. But it brought us into the code. If we go back to the designer, notice it says source and design. If I click back over design and double click on it again, it'll take me straight to the method that it created for it right here. So when that button is clicked, it's going to call J button one action performed. For now, let's just make it print a message. System dot out dot print ln parentheses quote button clicked end quote end parentheses semicolon. So I can hammer and broom it and green arrow it. It wants me to set the main class because if you remember when we created the project, we did not have a main class. And so when I click calculate pay, down here in my output it says button clicked. Now that's kind of lame for it to be putting output down here when we have a window, but it's just to show that it's working. And so that's where I'm going to pause it and make sure it's working for y'all. Run it. It'll show down in the output field, the output window, that. So this code right here needs to pull in the input from these text boxes. But we need to give these text boxes better variable names because right now their variable names are pretty lame. Look over here where it says properties. I'm going to pull this up because I don't need such a large... Uh, I didn't mean to pull it up that far, but anyways, if you right click on one of these text fields and choose properties, 
we see that the name of the variable, if I scroll up and down, eventually I'll find that, that where the name is stored. I haven't spotted it yet. Right here. Nope, that's the text. But yeah, we could change the text too, right? Because we want them to type in some value. So I'm going to right click on my first text field, not the label, but the text field. Choose properties and where it says text. I'm going to put 0.0, .0 just to indicate to them that they're supposed to type in a number. And then when I click close, you saw it shrink it, shrunk it down. I don't like it being shrunken, so I'm going to stretch it back out. And I'm going to do the same thing to the hourly pay rate. I'm going to right click on hourly pay rate, do properties. And where it says text, I'm, again, I'm going to type in 0.0. .0 and hit close. And I'm going to do the same thing for the others, right? The overtime bonus and the total pay. Right click. Zero dot zero. Stretch it out. Oh, bless you. And then right click. Zero dot zero there. But these things have bad variable names. And what do I mean by that? When we're programming, we don't want to look at it and see that we have to access it by JTIX field one, right? We want it to have a better name than that. And I'll show her when she gets back. So why don't we call this, I don't know, num1 and num2 or num hours worked or hourly pay or we got to give it a good name. So right click on it and do change variable name. You see what I'm doing here? I'm right clicking on that first field, change variable name, and instead of JTEX field one, I'm going to make it say JTEX field underscore hours. Now that doesn't change the text, but it changes the name of it. And then do that to the next one. Right click on it and do change variable name and instead of JTEX field 2 although Parker's will be a little bit different but it's fine that's why we're renaming them JTEX field underscore pay rate now why did we do that so we could pull the text out of these fields let me show you what I mean by that, and then I'll walk around and help y'all. So inside the calculate pay method, I'm going to double click on the button again just to take me into it. Oh, why are you not taking me into it? Scroll up here. I need to grab those pieces of text. So let's just get a string. S equals, and I'll get you back going in just a second. This dot J text field underscore hours dot get text parentheses in parentheses and I'm letting the editor help me a lot and then double space hours equals capital D double and this isn't going to work for you because we haven't renamed your variables yet but we will in just a moment so just wait a second double dot parse double parentheses s in parentheses semicolon and then just print that out system dot out dot print line print the hours out system dot out dot print ln parentheses hours equals end quote plus hours I'm gonna run it make sure it works except I already have it running over here so I need to close it where it was running Else it won't be able to build it again. Okay, so when I click calculate pay, it says hours is equal to 0, 0.0. If I come over here and I type in a number, click calculate pay. If I could see it, there it is, hours is equal to 10. So if you've gotten up to this, this point, go ahead and do the part where you also get the rate, right? You're going to need to read it in from the other JTEX field, create a new variable, and parse it as well.
but I'll do that with you as well. So let me pause it and come help. We're giving these better names so that in our code we can refer to them by good names, not just text field one, text field two, text field three. We want to be able to say hours and things like that. So now I'm going to do the next part. Having renamed this field as well to JTEX field underscore rate, I can go into the source and pull it out as well. S equals this dot JTEX field underscore pay rate. I should have just let it pick it for me right. Dot JTEX field underscore pay rate. Why aren't you choosing it for me? Dot get text parentheses in parentheses semicolon. And then make a new variable to hold the contents of that. Double space rate or pay rate equals double uppercase D dot parse double uppercase D parentheses S in parentheses semicolon. And we may as well print that out as well, just to make sure everything's working. We'll come back in and delete all these print statements at the end. And so this is the pay rate. So if I type in one, two, three here, four, five, six here, click calculate pay, and then I look down here in my output, the hours is one, two, three, and the pay rate is four, three, two, whatever. So far, so good. Now some of these things, we don't want to let them type into. They're not going to be able to type in their overtime bonus or their total pay. That's going to be set by calculate pay. So maybe there's a way to set those things to be read only so that they can't modify them. So I'm going to go back to the designer, right click on overtime bonus, just the field, not the label, click properties and see if I can find one that says read only. There's enabled, but enabled is slightly different than read only. I'm hoping I can find read only. Not jumping out at me. Let me uh, Google real fast. J text field read only. Not liking that solution. Maybe it's called editable. Right there, editable. It's the very top one. What do you know? So I right clicked on the field, chose properties. The very top property should be editable. I don't want that one to be editable. And I don't want that one to be editable either. Also, note that you can change the colors and stuff, right? When I was under properties, I saw something that said background. If I didn't want the background to be white, I can make it a delicate shade of pink. I don't know why I'd want to, right? But I could. So I just did control Z to undo that. Now, since it's not editable, it doesn't have a white background anymore, but I could change it, right? If I wanted it to have a white background. You could change the fonts as well, whatever. So maybe we ought to calculate our pay and put it in here. Oh, 
Okay, so I'm going to calculate the pay and the bonus. Double pay equals hours times rate, semicolon. And then double bonus. It's going to start off as zero, but if they work more than 40 hours, they get a bonus. So double bonus equals zero. And then if, parentheses, hours greater than 40, in parentheses, semicolon. And there's shorter ways of doing this. Then the bonus is equal to hours minus 40 in parentheses times rate or pay rate, whatever you called it, divided by 2, 0, 0.0, right? Because you're getting time and a half. So your bonus consists of all the hours over 40 calculated at half your pay. Let's print those things out. System dot out dot printf parentheses quote bonus equals percent f pay equals percent f backslash n end quote comma bonus comma pay I've made a mistake oh you get a semicolon there. I'm going to see if it works for me, and then I'm going to pause and help you all. All right. So if I click Calculate Pay Now, if everything is zero, there should be no bonus and there should be no pay. And that's what it's showing. If I change the data, I worked 40 hours at $10 an hour. There should be a pay, but there shouldn't be a bonus. Fine, don't show me. There it is. Right, no bonus, but there's the pay. Now, we didn't add the bonus to our pay, so uh, we don't get to see that yet, but we will. And our last test, I'm going to type in, I worked 50 hours. Calculate pay. And so, yeah, at 50 hours, time and a half, our bonus is $50. We'll just have to add that to the pay. So let's calculate the total pay, which is pretty easy, right? It's just a bonus plus a pay. So double total pay equals pay plus bonus. We could print that out too, right? System dot out dot print F or print LN parentheses quote. Total pay equals end quote plus total pay. But the important stuff is coming up. We want to display this information on the screen, not just print it out. We're probably going to delete all the print statements or comment them. We need to rename those other text fields to make them easy to find as well. I mean, we don't have to, but it's, it's a good idea. So I'm going to go to my designer. I'm going to right click on the overtime bonus. And I'm going to do change variable name to text field underscore bonus. And I'm going to call the other one text field underscore total pay. Now that I've renamed those, it's easy to fill them back in.
So I'm going to go back into the source code. And since I want them to be displayed precisely with dollar signs and number of decimals and stuff like that, I think I'll use system.format, which is the same thing as printf. So s equals capital S, not system.format, string.format, string.format, parentheses, quote, dollar sign dot 2f, only one quote, I mean one f, end quote, comma, and I'll catch you up, Parker. We're going to be done here real soon. And this is going to be the bonus. Now we need to set that text field. So this dot j text field underscore bonus dot set text parentheses s in parentheses. And to do the same thing to fill in the total pay. It's gonna just be another s equal string format. We could just copy and paste that pretty much. Copy, paste. Except this isn't filling in the bonus. This is filling in the total pay. And then we need to set that text field. This dot j text field underscore total pay dot set text parentheses s. And we are done. I mean, assuming I haven't made any mistakes. I think I'll put a character turn right there to make it easier to read. Camera room it. Oh, I have the thing running so I can't see it. If I maximize this, look down here, this shows it running. If I want to kill what's currently running, I don't have to go to the window and kill it. I can just click on this little X over here. And I'm ready to run it again. All right. Hours worked, 10. Hourly pay rate, 10. Calculate pay. Oh, and isn't that smart? What did I forget? If I was doing print F, what do I put before everything? I did it here, and I forgot to do it down here. Yeah, I forgot my percent sign. So go and before the dot 2 F, just put a percent there and a percent there. So 40 hours at $10 an hour, calculate pay, it's 400 with no bonus, 50 hours, there we go. Now maybe it would have been nice to print out the other piece, right, you know, where we calculated the pay without the bonus, but whatever. I think this is good enough. I think this proved the point. All right, Lindy. All right, forgot to start the recorder for you, Lindy. Here you go. This is how you make a constant with the final keyword. How many bytes, how many bits are in a byte? Eight. If you get to convert binary to decimal, I know you already know how to do this because you've done it in several classes. Eight plus four plus one, why is there no two? Because that's a zero. Know the difference between strings, floats, ints, and booleans, right? So if you have this, 9, and then you have, you know, 9, and you have 9.0, and you have false, which one of those is a bool or a boolean? Because we've got several types. We've got booleans, we've got ints, we've got doubles, and we've got strings. Which is which? Which one's a string? I know y'all know and are just being stubborn. If you got quotes around it, what does that make it? Makes it a string. And a Boolean is a true false value. And if it's got a decimal point, is it an integer or a double? It's a double. So that's a double and that's an int. Know how to write the main method header. Right? Public 
static, right, void, main, all that stuff, blah, blah, blah. Which of the following displays welcome? If you're going to print something, just know how to print something, right? I may just give you these answers in the day of the exam. I don't know. Well, that wouldn't be fair to the people who have to take it online. How do you compile something in Java? To compile something, you use a Java C command. So, to compile, use the Java C command. Now that happens automatically when we hit the build, you know, the hammer and broom. So, what is a .java file as opposed to a .obj file? Excuse me, a .class file. And we only talked about this stuff for one day, I believe. So I'm almost wishing I didn't have so many questions over it. Dot Java is the source code, and dot class is the byte code. What's the difference? If we go in Notepad T dot Java class T public static void main string args. System dot out. Don't type all this in. I'm just showing you how to use a compiler. There. Right. I'm not going to ask you this on the exam. What I want you to know is how to compile it. There's our file, right? Dir Java dot or t dot Java. It'll be there. So if I do Java C space t dot Java, and then I do dir, look what it made. It made a file called t.class. Java, t.java is the original source code, and .class is the byte code. And the byte code is what will run on any machine that has Java installed on it. So t.java is the source code. t.class, we can't read it. So-called byte code. It's the same stuff, right? We see, you know, like a refer reference to a string and we see our hello here but it's just been compiled into a format that'll be compatible with Macs or you know any kind of computer that has Java installed on it so the dot class file is a bytecode the dot Java file is the source code So if you have something in uppercase, like number files, as opposed to something with lowercase, like salary, as opposed to something with a capital letter in it, like string, which one of these is probably a class, which one is probably a variable, and which one of these is probably a constant? Well, take a guess at which one's a constant. It kind of jumps out at you. All caps. Yep, all caps used for constants. Variables start with a lowercase letter. Class names start with an uppercase letter. So I was just a really bad programmer when I made my little file here. My class name should have been an uppercase letter. When we create our files using NetBeans. NetBeans goes ahead and does it correct. Makes the class name an uppercase letter. All right. So, facts about Java. The Java runtime machine 
can be written to run on a whole bunch of different types of computers, including you know appliances, microwave ovens, and refrigerators, and cable boxes. So the Java runtime machine can be written to run on a wide variety of platforms. That's what makes it a portable language. And the other thing that makes it work on a wide variety of platforms is that the compiler makes bytecode that can be run by the runtime machine. It's the same bytecode. The way the Mac Java works is different than the way it works under Windows because Mac programs and Windows programs aren't compatible, but they read the same bytecode and then they do the same thing. So those are both true statements. That's probably also a chapter one. I have too much chapter one in here. I may do, do, do some judicious editing of the exam, but I am giving you the answers here. So if you have a variable named like this, number of colors, what is that called? When you put an initial lowercase letter, but then you have extra words with uppercase letters in them? Pay rate right total salary and dollars what are those called that's called camel case all right now the stuff that i know is in the quiz questions three ways of terminating loops what are three ways of terminating a loop <gasps> One is a sentinel value, like enter a score or negative one to quit, right? That's a sentinel value. But there's two other ways of terminating a loop. I know you all take, took the quizzes, so somebody tell me. Wow. Yep, there are three different types of loops. There's while loops, there's do loops, and there's for loops. For, while, and do. Those are the three different types of loops. But the three ways of terminating a loop is you can have a counter, right? Or you can have a user query. Those looking familiar from a quiz? You can have a user query, or you can have a counter, or you can have a sentinel value, right? A loop that's going to count from 1 to 10 is a counter loop like 1 to 10. User query is when you ask the user, do you want to run again or do you wish to continue? And a sentinel value is when you ask them to type in a specific value that quits. We have talked about loops, right? Yeah. This isn't news. Okay, good, good, good. Yeah, obviously not because you knew the, the loops. So the three types of loops. There's a do loop that looks like this do something while some case that's one form there's another one that looks like this while something do something and then there's another one that's got you know some stuff inside here right and so when do you use each loop according to the book one kind of loop you use if the body has to be executed no matter what Which kind of loop do you use if the body has to be executed no matter what? You use a do loop because it's a post-test loop. It'll come in here and it'll do the body no matter what. Right? There's nothing stopping it. There's no keyword up here that's going to stop it. So if the body has to be executed no matter what, use the do loop. What if you need a counter based loop? If you need to keep track of the number of iterations. and stop at a certain value. What would be the best loop to do that? Like if you're going to make a counter go, you know, from 1 to 10. And yes, you can write every single loop as a while loop, but that's not we're looking for the best answer. If you're going to write something that's going to count from 1 to 10. Oh, you would do a, I'd do a for loop. Yeah, you would, you would do a for loop. 
I'd do a for loop, right? Because you know the syntax for a for loop. For int x equals 1, x less than equal to 10, x plus 1, plus, plus, right? We've done that. So if you're going to keep track of the number of iterations and stop at a certain value, or you could just say if it's a counter loop, that's a for loop. And the last one, otherwise use while. So there's one post-test loop and two pre-test loops. Which are which? Which of these three is the post-test loop? Which one of these has the test after the body? Y'all are killing me. Yep, yep. Right, because the test comes after the body, right there. So the do loop is the post-test loop, and the other So good coding practices, good coding practices, indent your code, is that a good idea? Is indenting your code a good idea? Yes. Yep, that's a good coding practice. How about commenting every single line of code? Yep. That's a little too much in my opinion. We haven't been adding comments at all to our code, hardly. But it certainly would not help the readability if we had a comment on every single line. Instead, we should add comments for blocks of code, right? Read in hours worked, and then read in pay rate, calculate pay values, and then display results, right? That's the right way to do comments usually. So you don't need to comment every single line of code. <coughs> nah. So I'm going to delete that. That's not a good coding practice. Should the variables be as short and cryptic as possible? Yes. Nah. Your, your goal is not to make the variables as short as cryptic as possible. You want to make descriptive variables. So using X and I are great for counters, but you know for real data, bonus and hours and total pay and stuff like that, use real variables. And if we were following the book's recommendation, we would be using camel case, like putting uppercase P there. Should we save space by putting multiple short statements on the same line? Not really. There's very rarely any reason to save space, right? White space makes your code easier, right? I mean, I could do this. There's nothing wrong with doing this, right? But does that help the program be easy to read? Mm -hmm. Nah, that's bad coding practice. You don't want to put multiple things on the same line. Unless... Just and, mean OCD. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You try to make your code nice and pretty, easy to read. Should you put your name and stuff at the top? Yeah. So use white space to make code readable. And put a prologue block with your name, etc. Is Java case sensitive? Meaning uppercase and lowercase letters mean different things. Yes, Java is case sensitive. Yes, it is. Variable names. Which one of these is a bad variable name? 1986 salary or salary 1986? One of those is legal and one of those is illegal. What's the illegal variable name? You can't have numbers in front of it. Right, no numbers in front. That's illegal. This is legal. Because you can use letters, you can use digits, you can use underscores, but it can't start with a digit.
What's the name for this symbol? Give you a hint, it's also part of these symbols. So what is a percent sign? Modulus. And then you have addition and division and addition and subtraction. Right. What is the order of operations? Parentheses, Parentheses come first. Exponents. Yep, and then exponents, except this language doesn't have them, but if they did, and then addition, yeah, you were just telling me and I started talking over you. But addition, excuse me, multiplication and division multiplication. and modulus and addition and subtraction. Let's see precedence. Bless you. We do know what modulus means, right? If we have 10 modulus 3, what is that? 3 goes into 10 how many times? 3 with a remainder of? 1. one. Yep, yep. So that has a remainder of 1. So that's what modulus means. So how about? 12 modulus 3. 3 goes into 12 four times with a remainder of none. Yep, yep. If you have I and T, or parentheses I and T, it turns the number into an integer. So if you have x is equal to i and t 1.5, what does it turn into? i and t turns it into an int, and an int is a whole number, so what's it going to turn into? It's just going to be 1. Yep. Remember caret? We didn't talk a lot about it, but I know that we did. If we have string is equal to Ringo, and then we say s dot caret zero, what is that equal to? Caret means a character at this position. Well, what is that position zero? Capital R. Yep, that's capital R. And so what is s dot caret one? <clears throat> if I could type. So what's position one? I. Yep, and so on. If you have strings and you add them together, that's called concatenation. S equals one plus two. What is that equal to? Is it equal to three? No, it's not. That makes one two because the plus sign when used with strings is called concatenation. when used with strings. Kind of tight. If you're going to compare two strings, if you're going to compare S1 to S2, do you do this? If S1 equals equals S2, or if S1 dot equals parentheses S2, which one is correct? Just take a guess so I can tell you if you're right or wrong. All right, Parker, you can guess that it's the first one because that works in C++, but that doesn't work in this language. No. Yes. These are thought problems. I'm not going to give you the answers for those. These are for loops. You know how to use ASCIItable.com to look up a value.
All right. If you're going to check to see if something falls between 30 and 40, are you going to use AND or OR? If x is greater than 30 and x less than 40, do you want to put AND or OR there? So within the range, you use AND. Outside of the range, you use OR. And that's it. So do the look at the quizzes again. Look at these notes again. I will upload the notes, but I might make them inaccessible the day of the exam, just because of, they pretty much have every answer. So if you want to use them yourself, you might up, you know might write them down or something because you're allowed to use your own notes. All right. Sound okay, gang? Mm -hmm. All right. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. What? Can you check some of the future microphones before you Yeah, 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 sure. But we actually need to get out of here, so let me make the drop box for this so that people can leave. Yeah, that works. So we can use our own notes. Correct, correct, right. Okay. And you can use the PowerPoint, send the book. Okay. Fortunately, I have every program I can get my notebooks. Awesome. <laughs>